This is the Stage Resource. I'm Joseph Dodd, and I'm introducing here today Bob Chanda. He's the executive director and founder of Hub Theater Group based in Lubbock, Texas. He's also a One X Play judge and workshops status communication to authoritative professions like lawyers, teachers, and executives. He has a PhD in fine art from Texas Tech, but was in law before he found a calling in theater. So, Bob Chanda. How did you make that transition from law to theater? What, what was the appeal for you? Uh, it was rather interesting because I came uh, here to actually get my PhD in marketing, of all things. Uh, but I'd always had a fascination with the arts, and uh, I happened to be taking a, a theater course, and my professor said, you're an actor, <laughs> and uh, you, should, you should audition. So I thought, oh, well, this is silly. Okay, well, I'll audition. And, I went to my first audition and there were over 200 people there, so I thought, well, <laughs> this is, nothing's going to happen here, but we'll have some fun. Right. Uh, and as it turned out, I was cast in <laughs> Macbeth. Um, and uh, so after that experience, being on stage, really for the first time in a major setting, I realized, wow, this is, this is what I've always been missing in my life. And from that moment, I changed everything. I switched from marketing to fine arts and... From that moment, um, I've done nothing but but uh, theater and the arts um, since then. So uh -huh. it's been pretty fantastic. Now, uh, you you've been pretty prolific uh, in terms of things that you've done in Lubbock. You've been in the theater world for quite some time. Uh, A little while, yes. So, with all that experience, what really is the purpose of theater for you? <laughs> um, I think that that that's a really big question. But I think there's some very um, simple answers, uh, but there's complexity as you build on those answers. I think at the simplest level, uh, the purpose of theater is to tell a story. Right. We are creatures who really need our stories to be told, to understand where we came from, to understand who we are, to um, aspire to who we might become. Uh, and our stories are the things that help us to, to find those things. Uh, so, you know, once we say, well, what is the purpose of theater? There are a lot of different types of theater, uh, just like there are lots of different types of love and lots of different types of friendship. Right. Uh, there's a theater at the base level, which is there simply to entertain. You, know, you take your children there and get some popcorn and you have a good time. And uh, I think that is an important kind of theater. It really meets... Um, some really important needs uh, in terms of storytelling. Uh, but there are other levels of theater. And here I think the purpose of theater becomes more rich and complex. Um, theater often can hold up a light to society. It can show us who we are, who we aspire to be, uh, who we are in terms of the painful truth of who we are. Uh, and gives us um, sometimes a very uh, disturbing and raw look at humanity. All of that is intended to challenge us to see the world differently and to think about change and growth. So you know, the purpose of theater is overall storytelling, but then there's a lot of different kinds of theater, and I think it, at its most compelling, theater not only tells stories, it forces us to see ourselves for who we are, and in some cases helps us on the path to become who we have always aspired to be, because you can't do that without the truth. And theater is one of those, the strongest vehicles to create truth. I really like that emphasis on truth. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big part of our society these days, and I think using theater as a vehicle to convey truth and also to reveal truth in ourselves, in the audience, through that story, is very important. And it's also something that when I experience that in a play, I feel much more entertained and gratified than if I was just watching a play just for entertainment. And I think the, the plays that we do, uh, I don't particularly, it would be nice if people left feeling good, um, but I always love it when they leave the play conflicted, when they leave the play questioning. Yeah. And in many cases, we have used our plays um, as a vehicle for public discussion. So we brought together panels to discuss 
difficult issues because while theater can be educational in opening our eyes to these things I've been talking about, um, the answers really are within us. So it's just an impetus. Uh, theater can't provide the answers, but it can certainly put us on the path. Absolutely. Uh, so you've, you've directed quite a many plays mm -hmm. over the past years. So when you're, when you're deciding what plays to direct mm -hmm. and you're reading scripts, mm -hmm. going through God knows how many scripts, what stands out to you in a script that says, this is a play I want to direct? Uh, almost always it is, it's a small piece. Uh, because when you direct very large pieces, uh, and I'll tell you a story. Uh, the very first play that my theater ever did was directed by uh, one of my mentors uh, who directs at Texas Tech. Right. And one of the things he expressed to me was how much he enjoyed just the mechanics of directing a smaller, intimate, powerful play. Uh, because he is called on to direct very large plays, so often that becomes about managing uh, a large number of people, and it becomes difficult to do the close work yeah. uh, that most directors really crave. So that's number one. I pick a script that um, is powerful, usually a smaller um, script in terms of the number of characters so that we can really work on, on the issues of the play and really work on the acting. Uh, it gives a director much more meat to work with, right? You know, yeah. traffic cop, uh, as it were, you're more into trying to bring the story out. The other thing is, um, something about the story must reveal something uh, difficult, controversial, uh, something that gives me pause, makes me think. Um, something for which I don't have all of the answers, and something which may make me feel uncomfortable. Right. And um, I'll give you an example. Um, I picked the script Blackbird as the, as the last script we, we did. Um, and the, the show is about uh, a man who is confronted by a young woman. And what you learn in the course of the play is that he had sex with her when she was 12. He went to jail for it, but she's tracked him down. And the relationship between them is extremely complex, unnerving. And uh, in my research and in talking to experts here um, on child abuse and child sexual abuse, it became clear to me that this is a major issue. And um, one that we don't talk about enough. Lubbock is in the top three in child sexual abuse. Now, most people who live in Lubbock don't know that. It's a topic we should be discussing. Uh, and so when I read this play, uh, not having that background, but at least reading it, feeling uncomfortable, thinking this tells a, a human story that in some ways raises questions I don't have the answers for. Uh, and I think we, we ought to explore it. So, you know, uh, secondly, the subject matter has to be something that is um, uh, difficult, interesting, uh, and the third thing I, I really think about uh, when I uh, pick a script to direct is uh, I often think about pieces that challenge both me and the actor. Hmm. Right? So I'm about to direct right. Small Mouth Sounds. This is a play that's done 90% in silence. I love the script because that's going to challenge me to be very specific uh, in how I direct and uh, in some ways demanding uh, in how I direct, maybe more so than I've ever been. And for my actors, it is uh, a challenge to create specificity, as it were, in their acting um, with you know, great attention to specificity, the way you, know, you can get away with, with that when you're speaking, with the lines. The, right. the script will save you, but in this case, your actions have to tell the story. So. Uh, that's another reason I picked that script, and, and uh, Constellations is another show we're doing. Uh, this is a show that uh, shows a, a, a relationship evolving um, over time, but the concept of multiverses and multiple realities. So the same scene is being replayed, sometimes with different dialogue, with different connections between the same two people. Um, 
that is a challenge yeah. for a director and um, actors. So the third thing is is the challenge. I don't, you know, I I, I think it might be a challenge to direct Oklahoma. I always use Oklahoma as <laughs> example, but um, and I think it would be. But I like those kind of challenges, the ones that make me dig deep as an actor or a director. Yeah, and going off of that, uh, there are several different directing styles where I've seen. Uh, almost a lack of specificity in the directing style, mm -hmm. where the director will say, uh, when you say this line, move from here to here, mm -hmm. and throughout the whole play, use this accent. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically the blocking and the accent are about as much direction as you get as an actor. And going all the way to the other side, you know, acting directions where it's like, okay, move your hand from here to here on a count mm -hmm. of 11 while moving across the stage at a count <laughs> of 40, right? So what level of specificity do you think is appropriate when directing an actor? Well, uh, neither of those things that you just said uh, to me, and again, you're asking me, right. are directing. You know, I think um, the, the role of the director is to find, to help actors find truthful performances. So um, there, are, there are directors who simply, you know, you, you do your thing and then you get little notes at the end that's not me. Right. I am almost in the scene with you. I stop you. I ask you to do it again. I ask you to think about certain things. Um, I will never give a direction on how to move your hands. And, but I will try to help an actor by helping them think about what is the objective in the scene. Uh, why am I here? What is the motivation? I'll give them specific things because specificity is important. Not in, you know, you move your hand from here to here, right. but for example, I'm angry, right? And uh, so an actor will choose to be angry, um, and it won't work for me. So I'll stop the actor and I'll say, okay, why are you angry? And almost invariably they'll be like, well, I'm angry. <laughs> like, no, no, no. Because as human beings, I can sit here and perform for you 17 different forms of anger. Right. Right? Um, and they're all different. So then with the actor, I will say, okay, well, what has happened in the previous scene? What happened right before you came in? Well, this happened. Um, and the, how do you feel about the person you're about to, well, I get, why do you feel that way? And then slowly we will, not slowly, but I work with really good actors. They, they pick up my style and they say, okay, I'm mad because of this. I go, great. Now you have specificity. Right. Um, and I tend to work with really good actors uh, so I don't have to do too much on uh, you know how we move on stage, but you know I will do that too to help the actor. You know you're upstaging yourself too much here. Uh, you know let's have some proximity when you have conflict. You know you're too far back. You're dissipating the conflict. Okay. Those are the kinds of things. So I'm very very um, uh, precise, and it's interesting you say that because a lot of times uh, it's a new experience for people to be directed by someone like me. <laughs> um, but I. I'm dedicated to the actor getting the best performance they've ever given. And I won't stop until they give me that. Um, and really good actors hunger for that. right? They hunger for the chance to do it again. They hunger for the chance to make more specific decisions. They hunger to refine this moment, right? this uh, beat, as we call it, right? the emotional beat, to make it precise. Because the more precise you can make it, the more the audience can read it and see the story. Yeah. Right? I mean, uh, some of the best moments that I've had as an actor are moments when I've known exactly what my motive was, exactly the context of the moment, why I felt the way I felt in the moment, mm -hmm. and have lived that genuinely on stage. And it's sort of nostalgic to look back on that when you're in a performance that's maybe not so stellar. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it's, um, it's what Meisner said, which I really love, this is called acting truthfully in imaginary circumstances. Yeah. Um, and Stanislavski talks about that too, the idea of creating an environment in which you experience what's going on, and we'll put Brecht and Mamet aside, but uh, I tend to like that. I tend to like the fact that um, the more truthful and real the circumstances that I put myself in, the more I understand that, the more emotionally truthful I am in that moment as an actor, the more the audience will go with me. 
you know, there's a moment I had um, in a really silly play called Sylvia, which is close to my heart because I met my wife doing it, where I talk about the death of my dog, who the audience has seen as a woman this whole time. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, there are ways of doing that, and some people could, you know, drop the tears and start crying. What happened with me was um, I struggled really hard not to cry. And I never did. But it was a monumental struggle. And when the audience saw that truthful moment, because I really was, every night struggling not to break down, uh, I could hear them breaking down. Right? Uh, and that's because they understood the truthfulness of that moment. And they cried for me. Um, and that's what you want as an actor. And as a director, your job is to get that out of your actors. And, yeah. you know, I've seen um, novice actors and I've seen actors I've worked with who've been doing it for 30 years, uh, when I direct them, that develop techniques on stage and this is what I do. And that is sort of the depth of theater, you know. Yeah. This isn't what I do. You have to find and be vulnerable and open to those moments. And that's why I'm, you know, I'm very active director. Yeah, because as I mean, as humans, there's always emotions that we're struggling to convey to people, and there's always emotions that we're struggling to hide from people. Yes, and so I think that that moment that you had, where you had this monumental struggle to not cry, is a prime example of that. On stage, you're struggling to hide and suppress that need to cry during that monologue, and you have to feel it. Yeah, uh, and you have to feel it with specificity. And so that is the difference between me and many directors is I'm very active in that sense. On the other hand, um, one of the things, and I select my actors so I don't have to do it. With, when I direct high school actors, <laughs> I tend to have to do it. But I right. tend to avoid, as a rule, and I feel I've failed if I uh, don't abide by this rule, and that is I don't give line readings. I don't say do it like this. Right. And I don't say do your hands like this or make this gesture. Uh, it's very rare I, I, I'll do that because I really want the actor to find my job is to make it truthful and then help you to find as an actor how you express that. Right? The minute I begin to go external and say turn your head this way, do this, uh, I begin to take you out of your emotional experience. But if I get in your face and then say, you're angry, now why? Why are you angry? And I begin to make you have to be specific, you will have a better performance. And not, you know, again, it's unnerving for some actors. <laughs> but I often direct, I think of most directors direct, the way they want to be directed. And that's the way I want to be directed. The directors I've had who have done that for me uh, are the directors I hold near and dear in my heart. Because they help me yeah. shape uh, performances um, and reach these wonderful levels of performance that may be my very competent first attempt wouldn't have done. It would have been fine for an audience. They would have said, oh, that's good. Right. But we don't do this because we want to just be good. Or we just want Aunt Sue to, you know, as I tell my high school kids, Aunt Sue to go, oh, well, isn't, isn't he good up there? Yeah. Right? <laughs> what we want to do is tell the story in such a way that the audience forgets that you're an actor and gets drawn into your story. The suspension of disbelief. Exactly. And they experience with you. Absolutely. And I think to get that, you really need a very humble actor uh, and, and a meek actor to be able to take those notes and to allow themselves to be prodded emotionally that way so that their initial reaction isn't, you know, sort of like big F you yes. to, your, to your notes, that, they're, <laughs> that, they, that they understand that you're trying to get them to that best performance. I always sure. pick really good actors because I think they get it at a certain point. Um, and I think the best actors, the best ones, um, leave ego aside. Now I'm talking about stage actors. Right. I think it's difficult to leave your ego behind when you're a film actor uh, because it's a completely different process. Uh, but as a, as a stage actor, which is why I love stage actors, the best ones don't lack ego in the sense of, this is about me. Right. Um, so as an actor myself, I've had those moments where I come off the stage and people are like, you were so good. 
And I always tell people it makes me want to cry. Um, I don't care. This, this, <laughs> this whole exercise was not about me. But there have been those moments. Uh, I did a, a play called The Guys on September 11th. I remember the mayor of um, Lubbock at the time, uh, who was recently passed, uh, a really great guy. He came out of the theater, and I was greeting people. And he looked at me, tears in his eyes, and he said, I've been a cop for 20 years, and you got me. And he threw his arms around me. And then he didn't want anything to do with me. <laughs> uh, firefighters who were there that night, and I played a fire captain, um, were just coming by, just saying, hey, anything you need, we're, we're here. Uh-huh. As if I was one of them. Yeah. And I walked away proud that night, because not one of them said, what a great performance. A lot of them said, God, yeah, my captain's like you too. <laughs> or Because um, you conveyed that yes. truth. For them, I was the story. The story they, they, they took in. Yeah. So my captain's like you. Or you, you ripped my heart out, you know, um, because of the story, right? And that's why he didn't want anything to do with me after he hugged me. Because it wasn't about me. It's the story. It had really uh, resonated with him. And as an actor... Your sole concern should be about telling the story well, of pulling the audience into the story, and of your fellow actors. It should never be about yourself. It should always be, how do I facilitate my fellow actor from, uh, facilitate my fellow actor in their performance? How do we work together to find this moment, you know? Achieve that. Yeah, and I think, um, that's something uh, I wish I could teach more to uh, young high school actors who often aren't getting enough training, professional training, to have that attitude, you know? Yeah. Um, because I talk to, you know, college instructors who are fellow uh, judges and um, fellow educators, and uh, they talk about, you know, the fact that, wow, we just have to untrain and retrain a lot of these actors who come in from, from high school, often who are, you know, best actor awards, and we still have to work with them because uh, some of the basic principles um, they didn't have a chance to work on. And this may be one of the most important ones. Ego has to be left aside. Um, and so the good actors who want to say F you, <laughs> uh, after a while begin to see the results, and they don't. Right? They go and get... I've never had a play in which, uh, which I directed... Um, or rarely have had anybody who didn't get exactly what I wanted and who wasn't exultant about it later. It's a fantastic tangent we went on. I'm glad we came yeah. to that point. I told you, I talk a lot. No, no, no. I, I love it. I love it. I love it. We, we, we brought out a whole bunch of good points. So we're going we're gonna to bring it back. Bring okay. it back a bit. We're going to go back to pre-production. Okay. So um, bring it back to as a director. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've, you've picked your script now. Mm-hmm. You've got a great script. Uh, you've got about... Maybe a month or two until auditions, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe you know a couple of weeks after that until you start rehearsals. Right. Uh, what do you do with your script between that moment where you say, I'm doing this, mm-hmm. and the moment when you welcome the actors into the room? This is a really great question. And I'll tell you, uh, there are people who do what's called a prompt book. Um, directors who will break down every scene, uh, chart out all of the blocking, right. uh, and basically have everything done first day of rehearsal. And I forget whether it was Peter Hall or Peter Brook, I heard um, one of the two of them uh, was being interviewed about that. And um, they said, well, I always do a prompt book. And the first day of rehearsals, I throw it in the garbage. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So I don't do that. But I will look at the script and break down the script. Uh, I believe that in every script, um, as a director, there are five to six moments. It varies, but they're pretty routinely five to six moments you have to hit. Five to six moments that are crucial. If you don't hit those, it doesn't matter the rest of the play. I try to identify those moments uh, beforehand. What are those crucial things that we have to land, those emotional beats, the, those, um, those moments where the action rises to a breaking point. 
What are those important moments? So I tend to identify those. Uh, then I tend to uh, think about the, the characters and I do a general arc. Where does this character go? Where does that character go? Uh, and I try not to be too, uh, uh, you know, I don't write it down. I think about it. Um, so that I am, I am prepared, but then on, on, when we rehearse, I let things be organic. Okay. Okay. I let things be organic. I might say, well, here's the door. Let's begin the scene. And then I begin to tweak. I want to see what the actor's instinct is, and organically we develop blocking. No, you really want to be here because of this, right? Ah, oh, yes, okay. And then we, we begin to do it, because I don't think you can pre-plan anything. Uh, I think you need to know the script. I think you know, need to know those five or six moments. I think you need to have a general idea of the character arcs. Um, and general idea of character relationships, because there's some very difficult choices to be made. For example, in Blackbird, a young woman comes in and she's angry. But what's fascinating about it is somewhere in there they, you know, and I played this part, somewhere in there you're, you're, you're about to have sex. Right. Uh, so, you can have the woman come in and begin to scream at him in ways that women in the audience want to scream at him. Or I want to scream at him. Right? He's a predator. He's a, all of these bad things. But then, as a director, you look at those two things and you say, those two characters, and you say, there's something more complex going on. So here are the things I don't want my actress to do. Right? Right. She's here for a reason. And one of those reasons is a strange sense of closure. For her, she saw when he left her at the hotel room, right, and the police came and got her, she saw that as an abandonment by a lover. It's not something I want to see. Right. It's not something the audience wants to see. The experts assure me that, you know, seeing that person as a lover, especially if they're not a, a horrible person in the sense of uh, violent or, or that kind of thing, is quite common. That's the difficult decision ahead of time you have to make so that you can tell your actors you can't make this decision. Yeah. This is too easy a decision to make. and It's not close to reality. It's not close to what this story is about. So you have to be sure about those things. So you can guide your actors and say, here is really the, the view of this character that, that I have. How are you going to make that come alive? Because actors will often make, uh, and me too, as an actor, will often make choices based on how they see the character, and that can be very dangerous. Okay. So you, you, you kind of have this, this scaffolding of mm -hmm. emotional intensity. Mm -hmm. uh, a very loose scaffolding, mm -hmm. and then when you actually enter into rehearsals with actors, you fill it together. Yeah, build the structure. You have to know enough, and here's the here's the most important thing for directing. The most important thing. You have to be two steps, at least, ahead of your actors. There is never a moment when I've directed that any actor has felt, oh, he doesn't know what he's doing, or he's unsure. You have to do enough preparation that you're sure about the structure. You're sure about where, what needs to happen generally. Right? Yeah. Then you can guide your actors to reveal to you how we get there, right? Or help them get there. But for actors, I mean, for directors who don't prepare, who don't know everything, whose direction consists of every once in a while chiming in with, well, why don't we be stronger there? You become someone extraneous to the process. And um, if the director doesn't know where he or she is going, it becomes very difficult for the actors. So you have to know enough. While at the same time, those people who know too much and are too detailed will begin to direct the characters in the way that they would perform it. <laughs> and yeah. you don't want, as an actor director, that's that's also something you don't want. Okay. Yeah. And I've I've experienced that both as an actor and a director before, where as an actor I've said like to myself like this director uh, isn't going the extra mile, mm -hmm. and I'm going to have to fill in a lot of these things myself. Yes. And they might not even care. Yes. If I'm right or or if I'm wrong, uh, which is extremely frustrating. 
or you want to know uh, within the context of how we're doing this, is this choice I'm making, uh, you know, what is it? You know, do you, yeah. do you think it, it helps the fabric? Do you think it, you know, hurts the fabric? What is it you need to know that the director knows? That's good. Um, all right, let's move on. And that's, okay, now, when, we, when you did that, let's think about that. And then you think about it, and the director gives you some feedback, and you go, you're right, that, that is a false step. Right, so try it again, now that you know. Uh, because that makes you feel safe. Now, for some actors, it's, you know, there's an initial, uh, at least actors, <laughs> but there's an initial getting over the, I'm going to stop you, yeah. <laughs> and adjust where we need to, particularly at the beginning of the process. So, chances are, you're not going to get through, you know, if we're going to do scene one, you're not going to get through the entire scene one in the first rehearsal. Yeah. I, we may do the first ten minutes and get it exactly right, uh, or at least far enough that we have now something to work on. Uh, but yeah, I don't want an actor to ever feel the way that you felt sometimes where you're, uh, I don't know how this choice um, really fits in with the overall fabric of this play. Uh, how does this choice um, help everybody else? Uh, how, you know, what, what's happening with this choice, right? Yeah. Uh, and then when you feel like I have to create this on my own, uh, you're asked to do more than you really should if you have a director. That's the director's job, to, to fit all the pieces together and to know when this piece is going off this way, to say, no, 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 you've got to come in here. Uh, because, bring it back. Yeah, you know, it's sort of like um, I, when I directed Doubt, um, the, the lead uh, woman who's, you know, it's a, one of the greatest characters ever written. Um, and it was a really interesting thing because the woman who got me into acting, uh, who, who now um, has since passed, but just a brilliant actress and professor at Tech and um, Texas Tech and um, just a 20-year veteran professional actress. And here I am directing her, right? my mentor. Um, and uh, in, the, in the play Doubt, she's a very strong woman. And uh, you know, the antagonist is a male priest. So she just wanted to go after him. This is what the line suggests. And I think that's what you saw in the movie as well. Um, and I pulled her back and I said, no, there will be a moment when that happens. Here you want to, let's see you holding that back because you're aware that as a male priest, he has authority over you. Let us see you just on the edge. And the idea is that we build that over the course of the play, and then there's a wonderful moment where it all explodes. I said, I want the audience to go with you, and I want your fellow actor to go with you on that, too. So if you start off screaming and losing your mind... There's not much where else you can go with that. There's not much else you can go with that. And this moment is simply the same as this moment. We don't have the arc. And she looked at me and she said, you're right. Um, and I think uh, that is the role of the director. As an actress, she wanted that moment. I'm mad. I really want to do it. Yes, you are. But as a director, she needed me to say, well, there are several other scenes that have to happen, and there's this moment over here, and we have to have the art to that moment. And you're not thinking about that right now because you're an actor, and I, I really want you to be in the moment. But I need to be there for you. Um, and so, yeah, that's a very good point for you to bring up. As an actor, you know, you need to have a director who knows where they're going and, can, and help you get there within the fabric of what it is um, that they, the, the structure that they built for you. I think it's really important. Yeah. All right. uh, one, one question that I have seen in the theater world, mm -hmm. uh, and this is both for the stage and film, mm -hmm. is when you're trying to build a career, mm -hmm. uh, how important is it to network versus to do good work? Uh, this is a fantastic question, and um, I'm a very special sort of case. So um, I came to the arts late, and I have to stay here in Lubbock because we, we had children, uh, and we, we still have a child that's going to Texas Tech. So. Um, 
I had to remain here in this community. And as an actor, you really want to go and go to New York, and, you know, uh, and and this, you know, around the world, and 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 be an actor. Well, I couldn't. So, you know, what do I do? Uh, so for me, I decided to build my own career, to. Um, to do the work I want to do rather than chasing somebody else giving me the opportunity to do it. Uh, so I started my own organization, a nonprofit theater. Uh, I networked uh, with people who knew my work you know, because I was at Texas Tech. Uh, the, the people around here had seen me perform, so they knew of me. Okay. Um, and I, you know, with my work, and with the things that we've done with the theater, not only are they things that I, I like myself, but they have some way to tie into the community and become newsworthy. Uh, and then we also built a performing arts school, uh, built up a program, a performing arts school for kids. So this is the way my wife and I chose to you know, shepherd our career. The choices we made began to get attention uh, from the entertainment editor, uh, and over time you build credibility. So, you know, you may not make the money that Moonlight Musical ma Musicals makes with Shrek. Um, uh, and I don't mean to say it like that, I think Shrek is a great show. But, no, it's, uh, it's a good contrast. It's a good contrast. I think now what I'm proud of is that at least, knock on wood, at least for the past number of years, if I do something, uh, people are here to cover it. Uh, because people who love theater are here to cover it because they understand how important this kind of theater is. So for me, my career is about building things for myself. You know, the first time I wanted to, uh, to be, uh, I wanted to do some film work. And so I found a way to network with people I knew uh, and create an opportunity for somebody else to fund my first film, uh, which was a script that I wrote. Right? That was uh, later, you know, uh, had some exhibitions. So for me, it's about networking locally and with my uh, friends around the country to try to uh, create a career here. Right? For young people, I think networking is crucial. Uh, getting to know artists. Uh, particularly artists outside of your institution, outside of your community, taking every opportunity to travel. You know, I, I do stage combat, so, which is a form of acting. So whenever I used to go to, to workshops, um, I'm there with my fellow actors, and often we train in uh, different techniques. And it's really wonderful to exchange acting technique and, uh, with, with fellow actors from different places. So for a young person, networking... Um, is, is crucial, but always be getting better. Because no matter how good you think you are, uh, there are 25 people uh, just around the corner of the audition, not even in that city, but just around the corner at the coffee shop that are as good as you. Uh, what, how can you refine your technique as an actor so that you are open enough to bring something special into an audition. Right? Um, so it is a complex sort of balance between the two. If you don't have, um, and I'm talking about stage, there are a lot of untalented people I've seen in film. <laughs> uh, although they don't rise very far. You, know, you need to have talent to go. But in theater, just to get in the front door, you know, to get into my theater, you know, to be cast in my shows, you have to be pretty good, right? And so uh, theater demands something more. So as a young theater artist, you know, go to every workshop you can, develop your skills, begin to find out where you're weak, right? Yeah. Find your weaknesses. Do I, um, in scenes that require real emotional connection or emotional conflict, do I hold myself back? Am I an actor who doesn't like looking bad? Right? Which is a question I had to ask myself when I played 12 <laughs> I'm like, do I mind looking 
terrible. <laughs> uh, and I thought, you know what? This is a learning opportunity for me. I need to go in and just look like a fool because that's, you know, but still invest the character with some, uh, you know, some kind of strength because the two, you know, reside in that character. Yeah. So uh, if I were a weak actor, I might say I'm not accepting that role because you know I don't look good. Yeah, but, and that role in the last days of Judas Iscariot is very unique for sure, <laughs> uh, especially looking back at your theater history. Absolutely. So uh, uh, it, it is a mark of your talent that you were able to take on that role and to fulfill it so well. That's very sweet of you to say. It was for me a, a big challenge, but again. To your question, uh, every opportunity a young actor gets to do something different, something they're scared of, right? Something uh, that stretches them. Or go to a class, or go, um, you know, I I tend to be really clunky in movement. Do movement classes. Uh, begin to hone your skills. And the other thing about preparing yourself is not just networking, and it's not just workshops and working with great artists to get better. The other thing is being open to life. Maybe I, I should have started with this. The one most important thing for an actor or director, the one, is empathy. That's it. If you cannot experience a connection with people in your life, if you can't feel emotion at suffering that goes on around you in real life, if you cannot put yourself in the place of fellow human beings and the plight they're going through, even though they're not you, um, you're going to fail as an actor, and you're going to fail as a director. So live life. Live life. Reach out to as many different kinds of people. You know, if you're a person who's religious and never has been around gay people, go to a, you know, Go talk to people in a, in a, in a support group. Go um, meet gay people. Talk to them about their lives. You know, be empathetic as a human as to what they might go through. Right? Go talk to a Muslim. And, you know, you're, the Muslim guy you know down the street, go talk to him and say, what's it like living in Lubbock? You know? And become, through your experience, more bonded to the human experience itself. Right? Uh, yeah. And then you're networking will make sense. It'll have direction. With empathy, love of your art, training, then you'll know where the the connections need to be made. I think that's a fantastic point to end on. Yeah. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this interview and uh, I I've always it. loved talking to you. Yeah, so absolutely. Thank you so much for, for hosting this and for being available to have these discussions. Wonderful. No, I had a great time. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>